Well, this is somewhat unorthodox today in committee. We're taking testimony on some of the bills in our human trafficking package. And primarily, we want to discuss uh, Senate Bill 594 and 595. 594, of course, is the licensing fee and uh, the licensing procedure for locals. Uh, we've named it in, in honor and in memory of Stephanie Brown, who lost her life in, in a very tragic situation in, within a club in Michigan. And 595 incorporates a $3 fee for uh, clubs to collect from patrons. So I have with me today Don, Annie Donawald, and uh, Annie has uh, really has an experience to share as far as what goes on in adult entertainment venues, uh, how these things impact the individuals that are performing there, and, and the real impact on human trafficking in Michigan. So, Annie, welcome. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for sharing. And just, you, you have a, a, a background that you could share with us about what happens in a club and how it may eventually evolve into human trafficking. Um, my organization, Eve's Angels, sets up um, with support groups and outreach efforts into places where sex is being sold into three cities in the state of Michigan and other cities across the country. And so we're seeing this firsthand, um, you know, and I love the bills that you've presented, but we see it firsthand. I was also in the industry for six years, um, even here in Michigan. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like I have a bit of an inside track as to what's going on in the industry and, and why these bills will, will be beneficial. So if you're uh, someone who um, is, is um, someone who could possibly be involved in that industry, tell me how, if you're going into a club, maybe you're going in as a dancer, how that might evolve into trafficking per se. I mean, I, I just, I think that the, the level of ignorance, not as a negative connotation, just the lack of education on how much trafficking is going on in the sex industry is something that we really need to open up and explore and see, you know, exactly what's going on. Because, you know, the sex industry honestly is a breeding ground for sex trafficking. Sex is being sold in these venues, and so um, traffickers are taking advantage by making sure that their girls, their product, is being put in these in these atmospheres where sex is being sold anyway. And it kind of flies under the radar. If you know the subject matter, then you understand what the key signs are to look for when a girl is under pimp control or when she's under a trafficker's control. Um, you know, even back when I was in the industry, which to date myself was was a decade ago, we didn't know this word called trafficking. This isn't new. You know, so I was seeing this going on um, th with some of my friends that were in there that were under that kind of control. We just didn't have a term for it. We didn't have this, this new awakening and this new burst of information where we're starting to go, hey, this isn't right. You know, we're, this is illegal. Um, and so, you know, like I said, this has been going on for a really, really, really long time. And it's all over the sex industry, even just now. In our groups, we're seeing it and seeing it and seeing it and seeing it. Um, just a lot of girls being under, under traffic control. Under so control. if I, you have an experienced eye because you know what to look for yes. when you go into a club, and I clearly wouldn't probably. So mm -hmm. tell me what uh, you noticed uh, when you were you were involved in the clubs, and and if you if it's evolving today or if you're still seeing the same type of thing, tell us what you noticed, and then and maybe tell us. So the question always begs to be asked, why don't they just leave? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> and those are good questions. Um, they're legitimate questions if you don't understand, you know, conditioning and grooming. Um, let me address your first question. You know, it's over, the, the sex industry right now is bubbling, it's oversaturated. Uh, what's happening in this culture is that the sex industry is becoming less taboo and more accepted as the norm. Uh, by the oversexualization of women. And so we're making it cool through media, through different venues to be in the sex industry. Well, when you have that kind of, of um, you know, social acceptance of it, it balloons and now we have all these girls getting into situations that they don't understand. And so there's traffickers that are taking total advantage of this by going ahead and sitting in the club and recruiting the girls that are, are vulnerable. And they look for the same signs as they're looking for with the teenage girls. You know, and sometimes these girls are underage. I mean, we've gone into places where girls are, they can't be 18 years old, you know, and we, we see underage girls in these places and it's underregulated. 
And to answer your other question, you know, a lot of people say that, well, why don't these girls just go get a job somewhere else? And they don't understand, you know, the grooming process that happens and the conditioning process that's happening with these women. You know, no little girl, and I've said this to you time and time again, no little girl wakes up and wants to be a stripper or a prostitute or an escort or whatever. And so there is a conditioning process, let it be, or a grooming process, let it be through life circumstance that brings them into the industry or let it be through a man that then conditions these women. And sometimes, you know, um, a man can show up, he can play to her weakness, he can smell it because he's good and this is what he does for a living. Um, he plays to her weakness, whether that be emotional, financial, you know, she might not have a place to live. He's playing to her weakness, he's giving her and fulfilling a need for her. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's beating the crap out of her and he's keeping her in a place where her life is now in jeopardy. You know, he's raping her several times, he's conditioning her to be in fear and threatening her, you know, her family's lives. I mean, we hear all types of stories where these people, the, the, the atrocities and, and, and the horror of what these men and sometimes women are doing to these other women. The traffickers are doing to the victim. It, it goes beyond anything that you know Hollywood can even, even present as, as drama. And so now these girls are, they feel like they're stuck in a situation and they're lying. I mean, this isn't, oh, why don't they just leave? Well, because she could get killed if she just leaves. It's not that simple. And a lot of times, you know, when you are doing in the middle of a rescue, getting these girls out of the situations, you have to hide them. Because this is, you have to understand this, Senator, is that the sex industry, when it comes to trafficking, it's a well-organized system. You don't just leave the well-organized system. It's the same with gangs. We see this, it's the same with organized crime. Like, why doesn't somebody just leave the mob? The reason we know people don't just leave the mob is because we've seen enough movies. We've been educated enough to know you don't just leave the mob. You know what I mean? And it's the same kind of situation. You can't just leave this environment because your life and the lives of your children, the lives of your family might be at risk. And a lot of times, I would even say 95% of the time that they are. Okay, that's compelling and sobering at the very same time. Um, so tell me this, um, are there places where you, I mean, I know you've been um, other states, are there places where they have implemented licensure for, for those who are performing in, in clubs? Mm -hmm. and, and how does it work? I, um, when I was in the industry, when I was a dancer, there, when I was working in Las Vegas, and you had to be licensed in Las Vegas to work. And how it worked was you went to the club that you wanted to work at, okay? So you went to the strip club and you said, I want to work here, and they do an interview process or whatever that entails. And sometimes they say, say they're not hiring or, you know, go try this club, whatever. But if they want you to work there, they're, they, they give you paperwork. And then you take it to like a license bureau for, for sex workers. And you um, fill out paperwork to make, to register, to get this license. And the license looks like a driver's license, only different. It looks like maybe a library car, something. And it has your date of birth, your height, your weight. It has your information on it and it has your picture on it. Now they have a running database of all the girls that are working and you cannot work in these clubs without your license. Now, once you go from that club, you can go to another club, but these clubs track what clubs you're at and where you are. And it's, I mean, they're really tight in Las Vegas. You know, of all places, you would think that they're kind of more loose, the stereotype. But if Las Vegas has this system in place, why wouldn't Michigan have this system in place? We've got to get this system in place because you have to show proof of, you know, identity. I had to have my social security card when okay. I registered. I had to have my license, a picture ID I, or a state ID. I had to have, you know, they did a background check. So you had to prove you were who you said you were. I had to prove you had to I was. prove you were the age you said you were. Yes, ma'am. And uh, is there a minimum age out there to, to work? I, I mean, in some clubs, you know, the age is 21. I don't remember in Vegas if 18 was, you know, some clubs in Michigan you can dance when you're 18 because they're not serving alcohol. I can't remember in Vegas because I was, you know, I was, wasn't, I was over 21. So, sure. um, you know, even if there were different color licenses, that might be a good idea on how that works. But, um, yeah, you had, to prove your, you had to prove you are who you are. Now, now on this side of things, it's brilliant because when we're dealing with trafficking, now we have a database. You know, we have a database of people's pictures and people's, right. and the things that we can do to say, hey, this girl's missing. Let us look in the database to see if she's registered. You see what I mean? Are yep. there ways around, you yep. know, faking an ID? Yeah, but there's no way around faking what my face looks like. Face recognition can be tracked. And so now we have this working system where we're keeping track of the women that are in and out of, of the places where sex is for sale. I think, I think it's a must. 
So in Michigan, so we, if you went to work here in this state, mm -hmm. then uh, what was requested if you went and applied at a club? It depends on the club. Um, some club, some clubs here, not a whole lot. Okay. Not a whole lot at all. Did you have to prove your age? Nope. Okay. Some clubs, no. Some clubs, yes. Some clubs you have to show a photo ID and they, you know, they give you the, the paperwork for taxes and different things like that. But some clubs, it's like, you want to work? There's mm -hmm. the dressing room. Mm-hmm. You've about, got 20 minutes. <laughs> what about, um, okay, let me ask you this then. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about, and of course the one, uh, 594 is addressing an issue uh, where, where Stephanie Brown lost her life in a club. And uh, it's it was due to a drug overdose. What kind of uh, what what goes on, or what have you actually seen, or, or know of mm -hmm. in the situations? As far the as the drug scene and the alcohol scene, um, it's part of the culture. You know, this is part of the, the the sex industry culture, and and we're still today. You know, as I go out and I help girls, we get a lot of phone calls of girls that have OD'd. I mean, we've dealt with so many overdoses. Um, you know, and we just have to hope and pray that they make it out of that. You know, um, we have direct connects with rehab places because it's necessary. You know, we have direct connects with AA meetings because it's necessary. Like this is a given when we're when we're dealing with the sex culture, especially with sex trafficking, because a lot of times the traffickers will dope up their their girls to okay. make sure that they can stay working. You know, if I work and I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Now he's not making any money, but if I give her some heroin or some cocaine, now she can work another six hours, eight hours, because she's high. Mm -hmm. You know. So. Okay. Okay. So it's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. It's a means to uh, keep you as functional and as profitable as possible and as for as long as, as, dead as possible. Inside as possible. Because it numbs the pain. Absolutely. Okay, that helps. That's. Um, let me ask you this then. Um, I know other states have fees that they've incorporated mm -hmm. uh, and, and that money is allocated for survivors, for rehabilitation, for education, for medical and mental health needs. Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen? Have you seen any other states? I, our fee, I believe to be nominal, that is proposed in 595. It's a $3 fee. Have you seen other fees elsewhere? Um, you know, we're in several states across the country, my organization, so we outreach into clubs in different states, and there's different rules, and I have to keep track of which state I'm in and where we're at. But in the state of Illinois, um, you know, I just recently went into a club, and they said, it, you know, it's free, but there's a fee, a tax okay. fee. And I knew what it was for because I, I'm familiar with the things that we're doing here. And so um, I was happy to pay it, you know. I, what's, when you, it, this is the thing, and, and people will be like, oh, that'll sway the customers not to go. Let me tell you something. Customers aren't going to be swayed by $3, okay? They're not going to be swayed by $5. Um, $3 isn't going to get you anything in a strip club anyway. So if a gentleman is, or a man or whomever is going into a strip club, $3 to him is like pocket change. It's nothing because the currency there is $20, $50, $100. That's just like, you know, it, it's, it's nothing. It, it's nothing to them. Now, when you're charging $3 and it's going towards a good cause and we have all these customers and, and then it collectively does something good for the girls, any man that's, that's in there that, you know, is just there for entertainment purposes, why would he have a problem with that? Mm -hmm. to, and, and the girls wouldn't have a problem with that. I wouldn't feel as a dancer, if this law got imposed that there's an extra $3, that that would infringe on my finances. I wouldn't, as a dancer, feel like, I can't believe they're coming up with this new law where there's a $3 tax. Now all my money's gone. It's $3. That's nothing, you know? So, yeah, I think, I think that that's more than fair. Do you have anything else that you think would be pertinent that we should know that we, we haven't covered? We, we really focused on those two particular bills mm -hmm. in this package simply because um, they are geared toward survivors mm -hmm. and they're geared toward... Um, being somewhat helpful and and they of course that that money will have to be administered but um, we needed a clearer picture of what is is going on yeah. and um, how these pieces of legislation would impact that we are in such a crisis on my end as a ground trooper for lack of a better term we are in such a crisis of the need to help these women that are being trafficked that are in the industry to help them get out of the situation that they're in and back on their feet. I, I can't stress to you enough, you know, the need that is there. 
um, to get them resources. And it all lies in, okay, a girl wants to escape. Well, where are we going to put her? Well, you know, we need to get her some therapy. Well, we need to get her some medical help. We need to get her some counseling. We need to get her off this heroin. It is so real. You know, and we can sit here and talk about it behind this desk and it's all comfortable. And, the, and you know, the people that are watching, this is all comfortable. But this is really happening and this is a really serious need. And so with these two bills, this is, this is going to do nothing but help us. We have to have them. Let me ask you one more. Can you tell me, uh, with your practice die, uh, can you, are there underage girls involved in, in the clubs and from what you've seen? On a regular basis. Okay. On a regular basis. Okay. We're in trouble if we don't do something. We've pretty much talked about uh, what goes on domestically uh, in Michigan, other states in America. Uh, it, do you have any insight about what's going on uh, on the other side of the globe, uh, mm -hmm. other parts of the world? One of my biggest frustrations when I'm doing, um, you know, when I come out and I'm an advocate against sex trafficking is that everybody, the, the myth is, is that, you know, here it's not happening or it's not that bad or, but overseas, see, that's where we need yeah. to focus. We need to focus overseas because it's, it's happening in Thailand and Amsterdam and all these places, which it is, absolutely. But um, last year I took a trip to Amsterdam and I went into the red light district and I had really prepared myself because of these myths. I mean, I believe the myth until I went over there and, and I'm walking down, you know, up another red light district and, and I had a chance to spend time with a girl that worked in one of the windows. And she was telling me her story that she'd been trafficked and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, as I, and I was only there for 48 hours, but as I flew back to the United States, it dawned on me that the sex trafficking that's going on in the United States is, a th it's so much heavier and so much real right here in our own backyard. And then I started to get frustrated because what I realized is that I had been believing a lie, that the real problem was overseas. No, the real problem is right here in the United States because the lie that we believe that it's all overseas, number one, which it is, and number two, the, real, the, the, the whole lie that it's not happening here and what it looks like in this context, in this culture. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so when I came back to the United States, my passion for this, for domestic trafficking, it, 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 I became ablaze with it because it's like, you, everybody wants to spend their money and everybody wants to go help the girls overseas. Again, I'm not saying that it's not happening overseas. We need to take care of home. We have to take care of our daughters. We have to take care of our sisters and we have to take care of, of our girls here because it's, it's so rampant and it's going on right underneath our nose and we don't even realize that it's happening. Interesting you say that because when I go to speak to groups and, uh, and I'll go anywhere for any size group, but it doesn't matter what size group I speak with. It can be 12 people, 30 or 200. Uh, it, it was driven home to me when I realized that regardless of where I go, someone invariably comes up to me after the presentation and gives me a personal story or a personal story of someone they know or related to and it doesn't matter the size of the group. What that says to me is that it is everywhere, mm -hmm. it is around the entire state and it's far more rampant than we even realize and uh, so I'm just grateful that that we're shining a light on this, yes. that you're, you're a partner and you're willing to share the information you have because this is what we need. We need to get this out there so people get a better understanding and uh, they can understand indeed what the legislation is attempting to do mm -hmm. and actually change and improve and give some strength to uh, prosecution in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And, and another thing that I tell people is that you want to do missionary work. You know, I get a lot of missionaries that want to go. And I'm like, well, let me take you to Detroit. Mm. Let's start there. And I mean, I say this, to, you know, to people in Indiana, to people in Dallas, to people across the country that, you know, I go to speak and they're like, well, I really feel led to go to these places like Amsterdam and Thailand. And that's beautiful. And I, I applaud their efforts. But why don't we go to Detroit? Let's go to Detroit and start there. Because it's, I mean, we have a serious problem in Detroit. Well, it's spreading, apparently. It's, you know, it doesn't just stay in one pocket of the state. It, uh, it, 
its tentacles are reaching everywhere, Absolutely. and uh, in, and it's strong. It's it's a hidden society. It's underground. It's utilized oh, it's through in the Grand internet, Rapids, cell phones. Thing. Absolutely. And, I mean that that nameless, faceless uh, network uh, provides a lot of cover. Agreed. So thank you. Mm -hmm.